Welcome to the Music Business Insights Podcast. I'm your host, Orlando Alvarez, and if you're desperate to break into the music business and want to hear tips and advices from insiders, this podcast is for you. You'll be able to discover from the professionals themselves what it takes to do what they do and where to start if you're a beginner. Are you ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Music Business Inside Podcast. Um, and on today's show, I have with me Heather Kefalos Priamos, and she's an entertainer, composer, lyricist, recording artist, and top level certified vocal instructor of the SLS Vocal Technique. Uh, it's an enormous pleasure to have her with me in the show today. And I uh, just wanted to say hello. Well, hello. I'm so excited to be here to just be with Orlando. And this is the first time we've gotten together. So it's going to be very informative for both of us. I'm, uh, I would love to share what I've learned over my lifetime with whoever is listening. And of course, you know, pertaining to any of the things that I do, which are a lot of things in the music business, <laughs> which include, you know, the recording business, which I started in. And then, of course, vocal training, because that's what I do on a daily basis. And I do it online. Nice. And I also do it in studio. But right now, it's a lot online. Always wanted to talk to a vocal trainer, because I have so many questions. And that's a, a world that I don't hear that much about. And I just wanted to talk to you because um, this is a super interesting subject for me. Uh, and I know you can shed a little bit of light on, on that. So first of all, the first questions I like to ask everyone on the show is uh, actually going back uh, on their history. Uh, and the first question is, what was your childhood like? Well, I must say, I mean, my mom could say that I came out of the womb singing. <laughs> nice. <laughs> she, was a, she was an entertainer, my mother. I was born in Hawaii, wow. and we pronounce it Hawaii, nice. Honolulu. Uh, she grew up, she, she's a real, um, I would say, more comedic type actress, singer. And, you know, until she met my father, who was in the military, and then it was all about military family and having kids and traveling all over the country. <laughs> so, uh, but I, I was singing at the young age of three. My first instrument was ukulele. We call it ukulele, but in, in America we say ukulele. I learned all the chords from my mom. She started to train me in that. My dad purchased an upright piano, kind of like the one right, right behind you. <laughs> I started playing that at age four. And my life was just, it was great. I had an amazing family. I mean, my, my father and mother loved to do things, loved music, loved traveling, um, sports. I was always in some kind of sports and always getting hurt, <laughs> but it was fun. Uh, and then at, at about age 11, I told my mother, I really, really need a vocal coach. Please, please. And I think in those days, we probably called it vocal teacher or voice teacher and uh, coach is like a cool word to use. So um, she said, okay. And so she had a friend who, who taught music and taught, you know, piano and voice. And this, this woman was, was trained opera. So I started off in opera and I had no, no clue what that was. I didn't even understand it. I just, I tried my best and I had a lot of good teachers in my time. So basically my young life was taken up with music traveling to different cities with my military family. My dad was an officer in the military. And then, um, you know, starting to, starting to take lessons around 11, and I've taken lessons ever since. Uh, yeah. You actually answered the second question. Was, uh -oh. <laughs> uh, how did you start in music? And, and you just answered that. I yeah, kind of... I could, I, could, gonna, I could go further on that one, because, like, that was just till I, till I just started it. But... Part of the um, of the stories I'm I'm getting also is that along the way in you know we started like really young or li at least liking music and everyone's history is different. Some some people come on, uh, later on to mm -hmm. music right. and some people Just, like really really early on. Um, mm -hmm. And for me, it was the same. It was like really really early on. What was your actual what you consider your actual musical start? Yeah, you know, and I actually, I just did a post on that, and it started when I was, I would say my professional start, let's say mm -hmm. that, was when I was about 20 years old. I mean, I performed all over the place, but it wasn't where I was making money doing it. 
I wasn't really making a living from it because I was in college too. I studied voice at UNLV here in college. And I also studied in Switzerland. Um, so, and I had my aspirations to go stay in Switzerland and study in Europe. That was my, my dream. And my father was very ill and he passed away in 1979, but he still wanted me to go. And he sent me in 1978. He said, you are not going to um, forfeit this trip. I want you to go. And I'm like, no, because, <laughs> you know, I really wanted to be with him, but I got back in time and, you know, we, we got through all that. Um, so when I graduated from college or right, right before that, I would say, uh, yeah, it was before it was about two years before that I started working in a recording studio here in Las Vegas. It was a very cutting edge, uh, a very popular studio, recording studio. And uh, we had this jingle that we were singing and it was for a TV station. Um, mm -hmm. And the, the owner of the studio and also the producer, he just liked my voice. So he kept calling me to come back and do jingles and background on albums and um, any kind of ideas that he had for songwriting. And I, would, I started writing with him. So I learned at a very young age what it's like to really hear yourself in studio monitors and also with a studio headset. That is when I started to understand how important it was to learn from the best. And this guy was a, a very famous drummer. You know, he played for Frank Sinatra. Every, every major star you can think of that came to Las Vegas, he was on the stage. And his buddy, Buddy Hill, who his buddy, Buddy Hill, was my, my uh, uh, piano teacher as well. And he was an arranger and he taught me how to write. Nice. When I was young, I played piano too. Forgot about that. <laughs> so I wanted to learn how to write. I was tired of just playing chords in root position. <laughs> I really wanted to learn all the extensions. And mm -hmm. I took lessons from him. Um, yeah, and then I, I went on to uh, be the, uh, the first call at that studio. So anytime there was a call for anything, I was, I was the one that was there doing it. Uh, and then I wanted to be in a band. I got out of college and I... I had a marketing degree uh, from there and I wanted to uh, be in a band and start performing. I didn't want to do opera. All the stuff was, everything was opera <laughs> and I like mm -hmm. opera, but that wasn't my thing. And so I went and I, I, I auditioned for this band and I got right in and I worked in bands, all kinds of different bands. This was a pop, I would say pop rock band. So yeah, I continued with, with bands and, and I loved every minute of it. I loved it. And I also play guitar as well. So nice. I'm playing rock guitar. I still have my old Ibanez sitting over there and uh, acoustic. And then I, but most of the time in, in the, in the bands, I was playing piano and then rhythm guitar. So you and play, you play piano, you play guitar. Ukulele, I, sang, you I play. sang lead. Yeah. I sang lead, lead in all the bands I was in and harmony too. Nice. Is there something that you cannot do? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Like I, I, I was married to a drummer for a little while and that was a challenge because he taught me how to drum. <laughs> that is not easy having four things going. Yeah. But I, so I learned that. I learned how to do it. So I, I actually graduated from, from percussion back in Cuba. So I, I oh. know it's, it's all, all drums for me as well. And uh, I wanted a career change because <laughs> <laughs> it's so many instruments uh, we we carry a lot. So, <laughs> so uh, I have a question because I saw this here, um, and I'm not completely sure. And uh, possibly, you know, a bunch of people in the audience also um, don't know what is the SLS vocal technique. Can you explain what that is? Yes, and as a matter of fact, I'm I I teach that method, but I'm no longer with them. However. I learned a lot from a lot of very prestigious and very intellectual type teachers that I've had, that I've studied with all over the world. It's, it stands for speech level singing and um, Seth Riggs uh, is the owner of that company. He's the one that developed it. And then there was another guy named Dave Stroud who used to really made that whole thing come to life, who put that whole thing together. He's no, no longer with speech level singing either, but Uh, I did learn a lot. It took me like 10 years to get to the top level. It just, it takes like two years per level. They have it worked out that you have to just spend. It's like you become a doctor of, oh, wow. of vocal training. I could teach anybody, you know. The method uh, has to do with a balance in your voice. And speech level singing doesn't mean that 
you sing like you talk. What it means is that you sing just as freely as you speak. Mm, like how okay. we're talking here, you sing like that where it's natural, um, that it, it does it. There's no straining with the vocal cords. Uh, there's no, um, uh, it's like effortless singing. And that's what I teach. I teach people how to sing effortlessly. So when they're on stage, they look like it's easy. Mm. Whatever they're doing, it's easy. And I'm sure you've seen this in, in videos and, and people performing. Yes, actually, one of my friends <laughs> uh, was uh, making that same, uh, very same question, actually, on a, on a chat that we have uh, um, musicians, friends I have uh, from Cuba that are scattered all over the world, have people in Dubai, in Spain, in China, in all over the place. Uh, right. But one of these guys was actually uh, asking that. It's, do they actually sing these notes? Because uh, when I see the videos, <laughs> they're not, I mean, what, what I see is like, they're not putting any effort in it, into it. Um, and of course, yeah. it's, you know, it's different with uh, if you're actually doing a, a music video as well and everything is recorded and you're just, you know, doing the lip -sync. part. It's, there's yeah. a lot of lip syncing that gets done with videos. That goes way mm -hmm. back, way back to lip syncing because it's very difficult to shoot good video while you're recording the record um, <laughs> I mean, it's like, and you'd have to do it in the studio basically so I whenever i question been doing, yeah, yeah i think his question was like you know how a singer you know it's if it's going up and doing a note um you can notice in the face that <laughs> it's doing in a higher note again unless you are um, Celine Dion, <laughs> which, yeah. you know, you can effortlessly go up. But that's, I think that's part of what you teach as well. You know, just do it effortlessly um, just to be more comfortable with it, right? Exactly. I mean, you know, it looks good if you see people on stage and you see them even when you go to a live concert mm -hmm. and you see, it depends on the music, of course. Like, you mm -hmm. know, if you have Steven Tyler, forget it. He's not, he doesn't want to relax. <laughs> <laughs> but but he's going, ah! you know, he's singing like way up high up there. Mm -hmm. ah! He's doing this wild, crazy stuff, and he does it all night long, and his voice never wears out. <laughs> you never hear about Steven Tyler getting notes. <laughs> so <laughs> that's different, though, because that's rock, okay? But still, if, if, if you see him on stage, uh, he's got an effortlessness. I don't even know if that's a word, effortlessness about him mm -hmm. that he's very casual with it mm -hmm. and 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 part of it is acting too but when he sings he sticks his tongue out and there's there's another thing sticking your tongue out of your mouth so there's space in your throat so you can sing high notes oh. he does that's why he does that that's why all those rock singers they, i mean the tongue thing is really in right now again but <laughs> people sticking their tongues out but that part of of singing you want to be sure that there's space in your throat so if your tongue is pulling back, those muscles are pulling back that way. It's really difficult to sing a note, especially a high one. Because huh, the tongue sticks in your throat. They call it swallowing you, swallowing your tongue. Oh, wow. When I sing, my tongue's forward all the time, mm. either touching, my, like, touching the bottom, back of my bottom teeth or the top. And I'm really focusing on it, relaxing. Yeah. Nice. That's super tip. interesting because that's a tip that, I didn't know about and it's awesome because um things like this is super technical um leads me to the next question and and um, many people ask why why do i need a vocal trainer why it's necessary to have a vocal trainer if you're gonna be a professional singer okay so there are many people who who become professional that have never had a lesson i know several of them that are very famous mm -hmm. famous famous singers Sometimes people are born with an innate talent for singing mm -hmm. and they don't want to change their voice because it's selling millions of records. So they don't want a lesson. I've even talked to some of these people that I've sung with, you know, sung background for, um, you know, they just know I don't want a lesson because I don't want anything to change, <laughs> but they've been able to, to, to sing in a way that they, they have longevity. Everybody has, uh, a different physiology. Everybody has a different DNA. Some mm -hmm. people have rock solid vocal cords, no matter what they do. And then mm -hmm. there's other people like me. <laughs> I don't have that. I have to be very careful. Now I have longevity because I know what I'm doing, but 
part of that is very important to your the condition of your vocal cords too. So you want to keep your vocal cords in shape. And I always wanted to do that as a professional singer because I never wanted to lose my voice. I've never had nodes. I've never really lost my voice completely. I mean, I've had ras- a raspy voice from rock singing. Uh, getting back to your question about why should someone be have training? Well, it would be their it would be centered on what their goals are in their music career. If they have a career and they want to be a professional and they want to be as good as they can be, well, then why wouldn't you want to surround yourself with people that are are um, gifted and and or people that have studied that for a long time and can help you? That, mm-hmm. but that's the hard part is finding mm-hmm. those people. Really, really knowing how to find someone like that that really has the expertise and the knowledge behind them because anybody can call themselves a vocal teacher or a vocal coach by the mm-hmm. way anybody doesn't matter there's no there's no ro- there's no law or no rules about it for me i started calling myself a vocal coach when i was training to be a vocal coach it's mm-hmm. not i'm just not teaching because i sing i'm teaching because i learned how to teach mm-hmm. and so i think it's important that People that want to be really good at their game take instruction. I've been taking instruction in all kinds of things in my life. And, and, I, and I love learning. So some people don't. They make that choice. For sure. I hope that's a good answer. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. It's, it's one of those things that uh, I wanted to touch also on. Is there a solution for people who um, want, to, want to sing, but they don't have, they don't have the innate talent uh, to do so? Yes. I have had many, many people that have come in here, and I'll hit a note, and they'll go, ah, and I go a little lower, ah, ah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, okay, a little higher, ah. <laughs> okay. Yes, I believe that anybody can learn to sing. How many people have come in here and said to me, uh, my family told me never to sing, or my boyfriend said, I can't sing, don't ever sing because you're horrible. And to me, that made me feel bad because I thought you should let, if people want to do it and they love it, let them try. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I want to say that every person that's come in here that is what we would call tone deaf or really can't find their pitch, I have taken them through a journey as long as they stay with me. We don't know how long the journey is going to be with somebody. Mm-hmm. Everybody's different. Some people, it's, it's taken a month. Sometimes it's like two days and they're better. Sometimes it's a week. Sometimes it's a month. Sometimes it's a year. So it depends on, part of it depends on their ear because most of the time their ear isn't that great. So I've got to train them. Mm-hmm. I train them with, with um, intervals. I don't know if, if our audience mm-hmm. knows what those are, but most musicians know what that is. I train them with numbers. I train them with a little bit of solfege. I test them and I just keep it going through the lessons and also vocalize them. And usually I can get them singing in the first lesson. I mean, get them on the note almost always, Mm -hmm. sometimes not, but almost always. I don't let them go till they can sing the note I'm playing. (laughs) Then, and then we go from there. It's it's challenging indeed, because um, the, the reason I ask is because I'm not, the first or the last music producer or, uh, you know, some of my friends also that uh, do recording and, and they have experience with, you know, at some point with someone who cannot sing. Um, they cannot just do a no right. And at the time of uh, recording, if you're there for recording, uh, you don't have time. <laughs> But either way, you do what you do best and you try to help them in the moment. Uh, but it's, it's really hard um, at that moment in time for, for them to, you know, just pull back and do something. And I, again, um, don't ever record if you're not ready. <laughs> that's, a, that's a piece of advice I Amen. can give you right now. <laughs> and yeah. I, I'm pretty sure you agree. Never, <laughs> never go no. into the recording booth if you're not ready for it, because it's a completely different world. Um, and you talked about that. Um, but also, but also, Orlando, some of these people, they don't know that they can't sing. Mm-hmm. They think that they're singing in tune and they're not. And some mm-hmm. people tell me, well, tell me, I can hear, I know when I'm out of tune. Mm-hmm. And then I'm playing notes and, and they are out of tune and they don't know it. Mm-hmm. So they, their, their desire to do it is so much that they want to do it so bad. Mm-hmm. But I, 
completely agree with you. Don't go into the studio until you've been with someone who can help you do that, <laughs> help you fix it. Sometimes it's volume. Sometimes they, they actually hear the note in their head, but they're pushing so much air or they're pushing so hard that it goes out of tune. There's all mm -hmm. kinds of things that happen. And, and it's pretty amazing if, because I, I can hear what they're doing, I can tell them to stop pushing. And then, the, and then they come back and then it, it's kind of settles in. But when you're in the studio, it's, it's, yeah, that's pretty much a nightmare and you don't want to do that. <laughs> Definitely. Um, actually you answered my next question and it was, can anyone sing with, with the proper training? And I, I guess, I guess so, because this question, uh, it's also, um, not only for me, for, but for other people who um, ask me as well, because there's a misconception that if you don't know um, how to sing or if you're tone deaf completely, um, you're hopeless. <laughs> and um, for me, I was kind of divided in, in answering that um, because I, uh, I didn't see how. Maybe it's, it's the, the classic answer that, you actually what you actually need is a good teacher <laughs> and uh, that might be right yeah I, I i just tend to agree with that i i have people that come to me and say they've recorded a whole bunch of songs but but they're singing out of tune i'm thinking who who did that they must have done auto tune or they must have just taken the whole track and tuned it which is not fair to the artist i mean that's not right really believe me um uh, <laughs> just not. just the uh the other day um In, because I do, uh, I do YouTube videos. I teach a little bit of music production, uh, and uh, I do it in both languages, in Spanish and also in English. Mm -hmm. But uh, on on the Spanish world, uh, a question came up in in one of these Facebook groups, and um, they were actually disagreeing with me because uh, the question was like, you know, what if someone steps into the studio and they cannot actually sing a note, like nothing. They cannot do anything. They literally said, and, and quote, uh, if you're a good producer, you can make anyone sing. And <laughs> I was like, okay, no, <laughs> because uh, that's not what the producer is for. You need to learn all the tools. You need to know how to work with autotune in, and Melodyne and, and all this stuff and uh, know how to do it. I Literally, I can make anyone sing who cannot using software, but the problem is not that. The problem is that you're never going to be able to replicate intention or inflections in the voice or passion or the actual, you know, vocal character that the, the singer must have, uh, whatever the style it is, you're not going to replicate that with plugins. So, yeah. no. <laughs> I know everyone wants to sing, and in the Latin world, Latin music, especially reggaeton nowadays, uh, auto tune is super, super heavy. But there's a few, you know, um, artists that are super famous that can actually sing. Um, but it's a creative tool. Yeah. And there's a few <laughs> others that cannot actually sing. And they use it regardless, and they sell millions, even if they cannot sing. So it's one of those uh, subjects that are super, super yeah. divisive. And I mean, uh, what's your take on that? <laughs> well, you know, I like that's what I was getting at. <clears throat> Sorry, I got a little <laughs> asthma going on. Um, when people tell me they've recorded a bunch of songs and they're and they're pitch is not good. I mean, I know that there's people that sing pitchy in indie for sure. Because mm -hmm. indie is really in, it's like it, it has to do more with, you know, the raw sound. Mm -hmm. People want raw. They don't want tuned sound. Mm -hmm. So I think part of the people that you're talking about that are selling all these albums or all these, you know, EPs or whatever singles, They're making it and they're still singing out of tune. I think it has more to do with their persona. I hope I'm following you properly, mm -hmm. but I think it has to do with their charisma and their persona and what they're putting out there. Especially like, you know, when you hear that in rap too, like they're a rapper is rapping and he's good, but then when he starts to sing, it sounds really strange. Sometimes mm -hmm. it sounds like it's not in tune 
like they're trying to sing in tune, but they're not. Mm -hmm. And I don't understand that. I don't, I don't get it, but mm -hmm. people buy it. So people mm -hmm. are buying it. And then you just have to say, okay, well, that's what people want. And, and we don't know why, you know, cause we're musicians. We have ears. We're going, I don't understand this. <laughs> I don't, I do not even have an answer except charisma and what they're selling. They're selling something people want to buy. And I think it has to do with, you know, what the, the way it makes people feel. Mm -hmm. You know, there are people that have made it in music that we think they're not very good singers, mm -hmm. but it doesn't matter because they make people feel a certain way. Mm -hmm. I tell my students that. I said, number one at the top of your list is how you make people feel, not how good you sing. You could have a perfect singer absolutely pristine perfect voice and people don't want to hear it they don't even want to listen to it why because that person doesn't know how to emote mm -hmm. i can i can mention uh, a few artists that have won like really really serious awards me too and they <laughs> <laughs> I won't it. I uh, won't but i'm not gonna i'm I not gonna go it. there because uh, uh i mean <laughs> i i'm super professional in that sense uh As a musician, I still don't understand it, but it's what you said. It's um, it's part of that persona, that charisma, that the whole the whole package, um, the whole presentation, and and what they do as uh, as an artist and and all that. There's a um, best tips for for aspiring singers. There's a couple things you can do. One is now, <clears throat> is this pertaining to original music or cover tunes or just any music in general that you're singing? Um, any music in general. Um, so my uh, audience is pretty, um, pretty all over the place. Uh, but uh, there's people who, you know, again, uh, seeing either <laughs> EDM or hip hop or Latin music or just, you know, uh, pop or uh, you name it. But um, regardless, in general, something that you should be aware of. Number one would be your breathing. Breathing, if you have breath support, in your tone, number one, it's going to be more balanced. If you sing in tune, it's going to sound a lot better because it'll be clear. Unless you have a raspy voice, that's fine. It doesn't matter. You still need good breath support. Mm -hmm. um, there's a little, you know, the tip is that low breathing is where it happens. It's not here. You don't raise your chest when you breathe because when you do, the air is here and it wants to come out fast. Like if you, if you go like that and try to hold your breath, you won't be able to. But if you take a deep breath, I mean, for a long time, but if you take a deep, low belly breath, and then I could sing like, I could literally sing a note for like a minute or more, just at a, at a medium tone mm. or medium level volume. Um, that's important to understand how that works. Mm. Your breath supporting, we call it supporting or being connected to your voice. And some people don't know how to do that. I do. I can show you how to do that. But that's number one. Number two would be um, a loose jaw so or, or, or a looseness in your face. A lot of people tense up in their jaw. And when your jaw is tight, uh, that will cause an imbalance in your voice. It can also cause a lot of straining and can hurt you. Mm. And it can cause pitch problems. It causes all kinds of problems. And everybody has something they do. Nobody sings perfectly all the time. But that's a very common problem that people have. And when I say loose jaw, here would be an experiment for them. So let's say you're singing, um, let's say, uh, I guess, I've been a lot of places in my life and time, sung a lot of songs. I made some bad rhyme. That was kind of like real wide and my jaw was kind of up. Mm -hmm. So now I'm going to sing it just a little bit more relaxed. And a way to test that is I've been a lot of places in my life and time. Like it's very loose. Mm -hmm. I've sung a lot of songs. I made some bad rhyme. I'll have my students go and do that, walk around the house and talk like that. So <laughs> I've been a lot of places. In my life and time, sung a lot of songs, I made some bad rhymes. So you can see my, my, mm -hmm. my jaw is dropped, my, my, uh, my shape of my vowels are rounder as well. 
So that will happen automatically if you relax your jaw. So those, mm -hmm. so those things I would say are, are the best um, tip that anybody could use. Round, a rounder sounding vowel would be a narrow, like instead of saying an A, you'd sing an A. Mm. Or if you're singing an A, you could sing, uh, it depends on what it is. You could put mm. a little E in it too. A, A, something mm. like that. Interesting. Yeah. That's awesome. <clears throat> um, any tips for recording vocals, actually? Because vocal recordings are... You know, just going to, into the studio is just different. Um, and um, I know and uh, I made uh, people who come into the studio who are not aware of that, uh, about the proximity effect as well in the mic. If you sing closer to the mic, you're going to, you know, it's going to be deeper sound, more intimate um, and uh, things like that. But For, for singers, actually, any tips when, when recording vocals, actually? Okay. There's a lot of things I could say, but I would say I, I, I always let my mic to be pretty hot, but, you know, I let the, I let the engineers figure all that out, where I should mm -hmm. be, where I should stand. It depends on the song. Mm -hmm. And I would say that warming up to the mic and figuring out where you feel comfortable with your headset mm -hmm. because, you know, that's that's very important not just the we're talking about the microphone but being able to hear properly when you're in the studio because sometimes people won't mention that mm. and the music might be a little loud the, the guys that i work with always say how's the music how's the track how's this how they ask me like mm. all these questions or or if i have my you know uh, my artist in there they ask them the questions they know what to ask them and i think that's super important that you have a really good rapport with the engineer that's engineering you mm -hmm. and or if there's other people in the room that they can hear, make sure you hear what hear it best for you. Um, having some, some uh, reverb in the mic helps a singer to sing a little better because it's relaxing to them. It may not be recording on the track. Of course not. You're not going to record it in reverb, mm -hmm. but they need to have that. And then when they're close to the mic, they shouldn't, they, you don't want them to be afraid of it. So for producers, I like to people, them to encourage people to get in on it and then the hard part is popping the mic too because mm -hmm. when you're really close to the mic your syllabants are going to be you know accented mm -hmm. like a hundred times i i used to have trouble with s's for some reason when i say an s my uh my producers would always ds me and i'm like why are you yeah. dsing me <laughs> <laughs> i don't like it because it takes off the high end of the voice you know it doesn't mm -hmm. sound good to me but so i had to really be careful so instead of saying S, I would say F, S, mm -hmm. like really soften the consonant when you're really close to the mic. You don't go P or D, you know, with the plosive consonants, you're, mm -hmm. you're careful. You have to be more careful with it. And you should practice it before you go in the studio, not when you arrive. Exactly. Thank <laughs> practice you. Practice that at home. <laughs> practice it at home. Like practice talking like really with your consonants, you know, smooth. That would be the, a big thing for close up mic. Mm -hmm. Or when you're further away, you have to learn when you're going to really let it go to just back up a little bit mm -hmm. so that it doesn't, you know, send the, uh, the meters off the deep end. And, and you guys always have to deal with that stuff. And people don't understand that, that you can't stand exactly in the same five inches away. Sometimes when it gets really big, you, you got to be careful not to go off to the side, you know, depending on the mic. If it's a, mm -hmm. you know, a omnidirectional or unidirectional or whatever setting you have it on. So they have to understand. I think they need to understand how the mic works. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I teach that too. I'm in studios a lot too. So it's, it's, um, everybody's a little different. If they don't have experience, they should probably experience it at home with some kind of a, you know, just a regular, like I've got some Sennheisers here. They're like a couple hundred bucks. I've got, um, uh, sure beta 57s. Those are a little bit more, you know, crispy, mm -hmm. but they need to understand how that works for sure. And they should practice it. Um, what is the most uh, challenging moment in, in your career? Yeah, so oh, well, there was a few. I mean, challenging moment. Okay, there was one that I can pull up really quickly. I was singing, um, you know, auditioning for big shows. And I was in a lot of bands, like I told you. So I said, well, I really want to audition for these shows, like Jubilee and the shows on the strip. And I want to be like the main singer in the show. Mm -hmm. So I 
I went to this big, huge audition. There were probably like a thousand people there. And it was in one of the showrooms down here in downtown because down on the strip, because there would be so many people that would show up. You got all the dancers and all the singers and everybody wants the job. And all my friends were there. I went up and auditioned and, and then a whole bunch of other people were auditioning and, and it all came down all the way down with all these people uh, to another girl and I for the, for the lead part. Mm. And that was the closest I ever got to being in a big extravaganza <laughs> because mm. what happened was the producer of it. Um, I'm not going to throw out the names again, because this is a really famous guy though, um, that uh, put, put together the Follies Bougere at the Tropicana mm. hotel, which used to run forever. It closed finally. But um, he called me and he said, uh, Heather, I want to tell you something. And I said, what? And he said, um, it was between you and this other girl, which I'm not going to mention her name either. Mm -hmm. um, but all the producers, like it was a team of producers, they chose her because she was more flamboyant and she was, you know, she just had had a little more experience than, than I did. Mm -hmm. But he said, I wanted to choose you. I just wanted to let you know. And I was like, Oh, I was like crying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was, it was challenging for me because it hurt my feelings a lot mm -hmm. because I thought, Oh my gosh, I really wish I could have had that job. It would have just been a whole new thing for me, but it's okay. You know, that, that, and then, um, challenging wise, I, I would say traveling, I was traveling a lot and I loved it. But then there was a point where, you know, I'm living in a suitcase and living in all these different places. And I just kind of wanted to be a little more stationary. That was, mm -hmm. that was definitely a challenge. That is for any, any musician that does a lot of travel, I would say. Sure. I have a thing called a yeah. flash round. So I'm, I, you need to answer as fast as you can. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> It's a game. Oh no. Okay. Kind of. Uh, you have a little <laughs> bit of leeway though, but uh, okay. um, just answer as fast as you can. What would you be doing right now? if it wasn't for your current job? Well, I would be doing my, oh, oh, if it wasn't for my current job, I would be uh, on a beach in Greece, um, enjoying a good glass of wine and a nice dinner, and I would have people serving me. <laughs> nice. <laughs> We that's all vote for that, yes, for sure. That's, that's, that's a I'm good Greek. one. I, I'm Greek, I can't help it. <laughs> What is the most useless talent you have? Useless talent? Talent, yeah. The useless talent. Oh my gosh, useless. Oh goodness. I don't know. Probably, I would, you know what I would think it would be? I would say cleaning because I, I am so obsessed with cleaning and I clean, 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 and nobody sees it but me. <laughs> <laughs> That is useless. <laughs> It's futile. <laughs> uh, which famous musicians do you admire? Famous musicians. Um, let's see. Well, I always. Um, have admired, uh, let's see. Well, I learned a lot from Barbara Streisand's voice. She was someone that I, I played incessantly because I really wanted to learn all the ins and outs of it. Whitney Houston was another one. Mm -hmm. Just, I mean, of course, she's a, a singer, you know, not so much a musician. Guitarist, I love Albert Lee. He's a very good friend of mine. Uh, he's the fastest guitar picker in the world. He played with Eric Clapton and just mm -hmm. about every star you can imagine. He's we're really close. He's fantastic. You guys look him up, Albert Lee. He plays all over all over Europe on the spot. I love the Doobie Brothers. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I love 80s rock. So any any 80s rock, good 80s rock band, 80s, 90s, right in there. Music that makes me happy. Ambrosia. I love Ambrosia. 80s, 80s has a thing. Um, especially it's you know, it's coming back. Uh there's a lot of um uh, musicians now that are actually pulling back and doing a bunch of these tracks that sound super 80. I um, want to do it. Anybody wants to collaborate, you do it. <laughs> yeah. No, and, really um, <laughs> I have a, I have a friend I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do a, an EP with, uh, with him. Um, and we want to do, um, it's going to be in Spanish. He sings and, uh, we want to, we're going into the synth wave 80s thing. Mm -hmm. um, and it's super interesting. It's uh, it's you know the uh, music's from from the eighties. It's 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 awesome. I love mm -hmm. it. What is the best advice you've been given? I would say the best advice I've ever been given is number one, God first, because if you put Him at the top, 
then your life is going to be a lot better and a lot richer and um, a lot more loving and giving to the planet. Amen to that. <laughs> um, if you could change anything about the music industry, what, what would it be? If I could change anything about the music industry, um, it would be that, that we could revamp the whole music business um, of, you know, playing our music, like with these companies that basically have, have changed the whole dynamic of how you get paid. I think that, you know, it should go back to the, to where the musicians and the writers are given credit as well. You know, it's always like featuring this person, featuring, wait a minute, what about the people that wrote this song? Mm -hmm. And, and the way, the way things are monitored it's, it's gone off the deal. It's gone off the rails. I mean, you can't even monitor what's being played anymore with the streaming videos. I don't know. I just, I wish it was the other way. I would like, I would change it. I would change it all completely different than it is now so that we can be appreciated for what we do. Yeah. You know? um, I stand up. I want to stand up for that. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of people going on, on, on the back of, you know, big acts and big artists and, They don't even get mentioned, and um, that happens a lot in the in the music producer world. I'd like to give a shout out to to my uh, a producer that I'm really close with. His name's Blake Aaron. He's on the top of all the Billboard charts. He is absolutely phenomenal. I love him. He's so good to work with. He's honest. He works his butt off. You know, he'll be in the studio for 10 hours if he has to be, and he's just. You know, I'm sure, I'm sure you're like that. I can just imagine you, like when you get, when you're in your game, you're doing it. And I like producers like that. I love working with people that are, they give everything they've got. Mm -hmm. It's, it's great. No, giving, giving is the, is the way. Uh, if, if you give, you know, and, and, and giving in the sense that you don't ask or you don't expect anything in return, because that's the actual giving, not, <laughs> Uh, the other one, like giving something, just expecting someone is going to do something for you. But mm -hmm. the other way around, because that opens so many doors as well, like people cannot imagine. And um, last one, uh, what is uh, your favorite food? Oh my gosh, my favorite food. This is hard. I love food. Okay. <laughs> um, well, I guess I would say if it was just my favorite, it would be like, Cookies and cake and <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> you know, I mean, I my, I could agree with that. <laughs> it's, it's like I eat really healthy, though. I mean, I eat healthy food, but I do like good. You know, oh, you know what my favorite? Okay, hold on, forget that. I like <laughs> French pastries. That's my favorite. Absolutely. Favorite. Oh, yeah. When I go to France, I go to the immediately go to the French bakery and I pick what I want, and I'm that's then then I'm in heaven. The yeah. best but French, ever. Nobody can make pastries. I mean, I'm, I'm sure your country has good, you know, I mean, you're here in this country, but Cuba and, and uh, you know, all kinds of people, they bake great, you know, pastries. But I never taste anything like I did when I was in France. That's just way over the top. They're mm -hmm. so, they're so proud of what they do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they make their pastry. <laughs> I know. Well, back in Cuba, <laughs> not anymore but um you know a bunch of Cubans who live here there's a restaurant actually um i don't i don't remember the name um but it's one actually it's one of the best restaurants in the world oh uh and they're cubans and they do um cuban uh, pastry and it's mm. Nice. Mm. Yeah, out of this world <laughs> as well so yeah there's pretty pretty cool stuff there Just for people listening, if you haven't subscribed to the podcast, uh, go ahead and do so. Give it a like, subscribe, uh, leave a comment. And also, I wanted to ask you, people want to actually learn and want to improve in, in what they do, as, uh, either as singers or they want to learn how to sing and all this, um, how they can reach you? Yeah, you know, there's there's a couple ways they can you know get get me on Instagram because I'm always on Instagram and I'm at, I'll answer your question or I'll get in touch with you and give you all my private information. So it's just at heatherkafalis.com, um, or you can just look up Heather Kafalis. Uh, the last name's K like King E F A L A S, and of course it's going to be in the notes. 
And then um, I also have a website called onlinevocaltraining.com. And there's also heathercafalis.com. But you'll see some of the similar things there because online vocal training will take you over there. And so either way, you can get there. And then uh, if you want to, you know, discuss anything or or talk about a topic, I can do that on Instagram. I'm doing it every day. And I, I bet you are too early. <laughs> it's been a pleasure having you in the in the podcast today because this is so eye-opening. Like you have no idea. <laughs> well, and, I'm happy to uh, do And I would, I would speak with you hours more for sure because I have so many questions, but I know I'm going to have uh, the chance to speak with you again and uh, with your husband as well, which I'm looking forward to having, having him in the show as well. I know it's going to be epic as well. It's really amazing just to share a little bit more of the, the knowledge, um, the behind the scenes, what it takes to, to do what you do as well. And um, yeah, uh, thank you so much. Absolutely. It was my pleasure. Let's do it again. We'll have another topic we can cover whenever you feel you're ready. You know, it'll be great. I love doing this. <laughs>